Friends, welcome to Church Online at Laverne Heights Presbyterian Church. I hope you had a joyous Christmas, even if it was very different from what you are used to. It is good to be together with you again to worship. I want to invite you to uh, consider how you were doing this morning. Take a moment and check in and ask, how am I? How am I? I mean, if there were a word or a phrase that could capture how you are this morning as we gather together to worship, I want to invite you to name that before God. And so at this time, please take a minute and just reflect and gather up yourself and place yourself before the God who calls us together. I know as I come to worship this morning, I come with a sense of hurriedness that I would love to be able to set down. And it's precisely with that hurriedness that I gather with you, my brothers and sisters, and, and we worship. So I want to invite you to uh, hold how you are doing in the presence of the God who calls us. God sees, God knows. God knows if we are here for this time of worship rejoicing, and God knows if we are here in this time of worship carrying heavy sorrows, if we just want to let our bodies sink under the weight of everything. God understands, and God receives us right where we are, just as we are. If you are not familiar with Laverne Heights, we are an intergenerational family of faith following Jesus growing together, and sharing God's love with neighbors near and far. If it's your first time with us, we are delighted to have you, and we hope that this worship refreshes your spirit and draws you closer to Christ our Lord. And beloved of God, welcome to Church Online. Friends, as we consider the marvelous thing that God has done for us in the birth of Jesus Christ, let us call ourselves to worship in the words of the psalmist. This is taken from Psalm 148. Hear these words with me and let them lift your spirit. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from heaven. Praise God on the heights. Praise God, all of you who are his messengers. Praise God, all of you who comprise his heavenly forces, sun and moon, praise God. All of you bright stars, praise God. You highest heaven, praise God. Do the same, you waters that are above the sky. Let all of these praise the Lord's name, because God gave the command and they were created. God set them in place always and forever. God made a law that will not be broken. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all you ocean depths. Do the same fire and hail, snow and smoke, stormy wind that does what God says. Do the same, you mountains, every single hill, fruit trees and every single cedar. Do the same, you animals, wild or tame, you creatures that creep along and you birds that fly. Do the same, you kings of the earth and every single person, you princes and every single ruler on earth. Do the same, you young men, young women too, you who are old together with you who are young. Let all of these praise the Lord's name, because only God's name is high over all. Only God's majesty is over earth and heaven. God raised the strength of his people, the praise of all his faithful ones. That's Israel, the people who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Friends, God has raised us in Jesus Christ. Let us praise the Lord as we gather to worship.
Friends, we are continuing on in our sermon series, We Are Witnesses. Uh, Today we are in Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 22. We started this series back before Advent. We've been working our way through the book of Acts, asking what it has to say to us as we live in a time of transition, uh, uncertainty, upheaval. Uh, We're listening for what God might have to say. The early church was living in times of transition and upheaval. Jesus had been raised and ascended, and his early followers were trying to figure out what this new reality meant for their lives as they sought to be faithful. In much the same way, 2020 has been a year of tremendous upheaval and change. And as we ask ourselves, what does it mean for us to be faithful in this time, in this season, we're listening in to the book of Acts. Again, we are in chapter 15, beginning at verse 22. Before I read the scripture lesson, will you please join me in prayer? Holy God, fill up my words with your Holy Spirit. Fill up the meditations of all our hearts and minds with your Holy Spirit, that we might hear together what you have to say to us this day. Lord, we pray that you would speak your word, that it would bear fruits in our lives, and that we would live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Again, we're in Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 22. I want to invite you to open up your Bible so that you can follow along. If you're using an app, uh, bring the scripture up so that you can follow along that way. Again, Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 22. I invite you to listen now to the word of the Lord and for God's word to you today. The apostles and elders, along with the entire church, agreed to send some delegates chosen from among themselves to Antioch, together with Paul and Barnabas. They selected Judas, Barsabas, and Silas, who were leaders among the brothers and sisters. They were to carry this letter. Here's the letter. The apostles and the elders to the Gentile brothers and sisters in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We've heard that some of our number have disturbed you with unsettling words we didn't authorize. We reached a united decision to select some delegates and send them to you, along with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul. These people have devoted their lives to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas. They will confirm what we have written. The Holy Spirit has led us to the decision that no burden should be placed on you other than these essentials. Refuse food offered to idols, blood, the meat from strangled animals, and sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid such things. Farewell. When Barnabas, Paul, and the delegates were sent on their way, they went down to Antioch. They gathered the believers and delivered the letter. The people read it, delighted with its encouraging message. Judas and Silas were prophets, and they said many things that encouraged and strengthened the brothers and sisters. Judas and Silas stayed there a while, then were sent back with a blessing of peace from the brothers and sisters to those who first sent them. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, where together with many others, they taught and proclaimed the good news of the Lord's word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The scene was a church choir room at a Wednesday evening rehearsal. The choir was sitting in rows. It was about four or five deep, and a man sat on the very back row and leaned into his neighbor, whispered in his ear, and slandered a man sitting a few rows down. See, that man had been involved in a very public fall just about a year earlier, a very public disgrace, public enough that his face had been on the nightly news. His name had been in the paper. Everybody knew about it. And then that man on the back row was scandalized at his presence. He leaned into his neighbor and said so. That man ought not be here. He shouldn't have anything to do with this. Do you know what he has done? 
there's an implicit question that lives underneath the slander, and it's this, can I stay if you're here? Can I stay if you're here? We live in a world that embraces that question. Over this past election cycle, we are all aware of, of just how divisive our politics have become. I read in the paper the story of a family, a mother and son. They were close before the election, but after the election, the son disowned his mother. He told her he would no longer have anything to do with her, would not speak to her, would not visit her because of who she voted for. There is a question underneath that action. Can I stay if you're here? When I was serving my first church, uh, there was a story uh, that was told to me a few years before my arrival. In the middle of the 1990s, a young couple had come to visit the church. They, they came in, they sat down in the front row. And most small churches would be thrilled to have a young couple come and sit down in, in the front row. They would be excited to have them there. And young people, the potential of young life of kids down the road. It's most small churches' dream. But as that couple sat there, one of the elders of the congregation walked up to the family. The husband was Hispanic. And the man said, the elder said, in the middle of the 1990s, the elder said to the man sitting there, the church for your kind is down the street. The question is there, can I stay if you're here? We live in a world that embraces this question. Can I stay if you're here? This past year has revealed the depths of this question. It's, it's revealed uh, the, the racial wounds that still live in our culture. It's shown us just how deep some of those wounds run. Can I stay if you're here? There are a couple lies that can come from this question. The first is this. Underneath the question can be the supposition that I deserve to be here, you don't. I deserve to be here, but not you. It takes a special kind of pride to suppose I deserve to be here, but not you. Of course, the question, can I stay if you're here, it's not always so malicious. It's not always so uh, self-evidently thick with sin. Instead, sometimes it comes in a subtler fashion. It's about this comfort. Right? We come along to a location and we try to figure out, am I comfortable here? There's an assumption, I deserve to be comfortable Right, and so many people will come into the church and they'll say they're going to go, and you ask why, and it's, well, I, I don't like the music. Right? I didn't like the way the liturgy was. It was too conservative or traditional or it was too contemporary. There are all sorts of answers that are given that sort of reveal that people are approaching their experience of church much like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Like, this one's not quite right. Oh, this one's not quite right. And they're looking for comfort. Can I be here if you're here? Can I be comfortable if you're here? Our scripture this morning is all about this question of can I be here if you're here? It starts out this way. The context is this, that some people came from Jerusalem, Jewish Christians, Jewish Christians who were following Jesus, but, but still had some things to work out, right? Every, the implications of Jesus weren't all clear in their minds. So, so they carried with them the assumption that their salvation was still tied up in their keeping the law. Even though they believed in Jesus, even though they believed that God had raised him from the dead, the, the implications had not uh, struck them yet. And so they carried with them this understanding that, that if you're going to be saved, you've got to keep the law. And they carried that understanding to the church in Antioch, where they found Gentile Christians. And they told those Gentile Christians, can I be here if you're here? And their answer was, yes, if you will be circumcised, if you will take on the law, if you will follow all these things. And this troubled the Gentile Christians, right? It didn't resonate with 
what they were hearing from Paul and Barnabas. And yet, these folks, they made some sense, and it became enough of an issue that Paul and Barnabas uh, went on a trip back to Jerusalem so they could bring this question to the Jerusalem church, so that they could come to some resolution together. The first part of chapter 15 in Acts is all about this conversation. It's like a powerhouse of, of theological heavyweights getting together. Paul, Barnabas, Peter, James, all the leaders in the early church gathered together with the Jerusalem church, and they're trying to figure this thing out. And Paul and Barnabas, they arrive, and, and they give their report, and they talk about what's happened. They, at one point in the conversation, Peter the Apostle Peter stands up and he says, Look, everyone, you know how God gave me this mission of ministry to the Gentiles, to take good news to the Gentiles. And, and you know my experience about what happened, how God poured out his Holy Spirit upon Gentiles. And you know how that happened. And he says, I, It doesn't make sense to me that, that we would put a burden on Gentiles that we were never able to carry ourselves. Our ancestors were never able to carry ourselves. It, it doesn't make sense to put the law on them when we couldn't handle it either. In effect, he says something profound at the end. This is verse 11. Uh, he says this, On the contrary, we believe that we and they are saved in the same way by the grace of the Lord Jesus. All right, so the conversation, it's shifted as the council's gathered from this direct question about circumcision and keeping the law. It's gotten to the core issue underneath, which is what is the nature of salvation? How are we saved? And, and Peter stands up and he names it clearly and he says, we are saved in the same way together by grace. We are saved by grace. It does not have to do with keeping the law. After he spoke, the whole assembly fell quiet, and Paul and Barnabas began to speak again, and they talked about all the ways that God was at work in the Gentiles, and the community was moved. And then at some point, James, James, the great leader in the Jerusalem church, he stood up, and he said, look, Simon's given us, Peter's given us his report, and now here's what I think. Uh, his report it meshes with Scripture. It lines up with Scripture. I mean, as we see what God is doing in the Holy Spirit, it resonates with what we can read about in the prophets. And so he says, here's what I propose. I conclude that we shouldn't create problems for the Gentiles who turn to God. Instead, we should write a letter telling them to avoid the pollution associated with idols, sexual immorality, eating meat from strangled animals, and consuming blood. How are we to make and interpret James' message here? Right? He says we shouldn't put any burden on the Gentile, and then he proposes these four things. Uh, scholars disagree about how to understand these prohibitions. Now, there are two particular things I want to highlight as possibilities. Well, one possibility is this, that, that this is a pastoral concern coming from James, that he cares about encouraging these Gentile Christians in the faith, and he understands, he understands that they live in a world that is rooted in idolatry. Some scholars will point out that all four of these prohibitions are likely connected to temple worship. And so from this point of view, James is trying to give some pastoral concern to the Gentiles. He's trying to say, look, idolatry is going to be a temptation for you. But he understood that they were still embedded in a culture of idolatry, right? They still had family members who were worshiping at the temple. They had colleagues who were worshiping at the temple, right? They were living in a social system that is still embedded in idolatry. And James is saying, look, the greatest risk you have, the greatest risk right now is toward idolatry. So avoid these things. It's a way of pastorally saying, look, be aware of the danger of idolatry and avoid it by avoiding these things. Another possible interpretation is that James is concerned with table fellowship. And he understands that we should not burden the Gentiles with the law, but at the same time, he recognized that the Jewish Christians were going to be scandalized, that there were huge leaps they were having to make in their own understanding to, to be at a table together 
uh, with Gentiles. And so perhaps he's saying, look, avoid these four things because they are the things that your Jewish brothers and sisters are going to find most scandalous. They're the things that are going to make fellowship most difficult. Avoid these things so that you can be together at the table, so that you can be together as the body of Christ. Whichever of these two it may be, perhaps both of these concerns are behind this for James. The, the whole council agrees. It's so important to just notice that the whole council agrees. Sometimes there are those who will talk as though James and Paul are sort of pitted against each other in the way that they understand the gospel. And they'll say that James never got it, but he was a legalist who just never understood and Paul, on the other hand, has the gospel. It's worth noting that here, Paul, Barnabas, James, Peter, they are all together and they all agree. They are of, of one mind as this message goes back to the Antioch church. And that's what it does. The message goes back to the church in Antioch. The apostles and elders, along with the entire church, agreed to send some messengers with a letter to bring them the good news of uh, their decision about how uh, they should think and consider these things. Some people in our world wonder if it's possible for divisions to be overcome. It's especially highlighted in the church in particular, as we consider uh, what it might mean to become a multi-ethnic family of faith, there are those who wonder, is it even possible? Can it be done? Or is our divided witness the best we can hope for on this side of Christ's return? It's a question. It's a question that has to be taken seriously because the church doesn't have a great track record when it comes to living a multi-ethnic witness in the world. We have a stronger track record for dividing ourselves up according to our own preferences and comfort and sense of holiness. But the question abides, if God has drawn us together in Jesus Christ by grace, is it possible? Oh, we live in a world that, that wonders, is it possible to, to cross divisions. We live with our political divisions that are as severe as they have ever been. There's conversation again in the news just uh, recently about whether conservative states should secede from the union. I forget whether or not we would consider them fridge voices. It's being voiced enough that it's being heard. And we live with these divisions and some people are saying the divisions have gotten too deep. The root things are too severe. We can't live together. Is it possible? This is political danger is alive in the life of the church as churches are tempted to become either conservative or liberal locations. Right? It's entirely possible for churches to continue to divide up in a way that we just identify them as, oh, that's the conservative church or that's the liberal church. And that's not how it should be. Uh, certainly, conservatism, liberalism, neither uh, has a grasp on the gospel. The gospel is not accountable to either. The gospel transcends both. The gospel judges both. And the church is called to be made up of both. Uh, the church is called to be something uh, deeper, something purer, something holier. Can we live together across our divides? Timothy Keller, the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, had a recent op-ed where he talked about the dangers of partisanship in the church, right? how we can fall into the trap of using the gospel to bolster our political parties. His point isn't that the gospel doesn't have implications. Of course it does. And the church has discussed those implications throughout its whole life, and it's had a remarkably clear, consistent message for 2,000 years. But the point is this, that the church's convictions historically don't line up with either political party. That you can take some issues and, and some party clearly seems to be in line closer to what the church has historically taught, but then on other issues you've got to walk across the aisle. 
And if that's true, then what does it mean for Christians to think about our engagement in politics? As we live our life in the world, there is this question that, that comes home in the church of, can we be together? It's this question we started with, can I stay if you're here? Can I stay if you're here? It's at this point that we need to see, as we hit the crisis of this question in our world, in our own lives, I mean, truth be told, don't we all know that there's somebody who could sit down next to us and we would start to wonder, can I stay if you're here? As we face the crisis of that question, we have to marvel and see the beautiful thing that God has done for us that God has drawn us together in the grace of Jesus Christ. This is the message that comes so clearly out of our scripture reading in Acts 15. Peter says it best when he stands up, on the contrary, we believe that we and they, Jews and Gentiles, Jewish followers, Gentile followers, together we are saved in the same way, which is by the grace of God. Of the Lord Jesus. See, church, it's grace that draws the church together in Acts. It's grace that continues to work to bind together Jew and Gentile. Understand just how separated they were at this time, and you will see the marvelous thing that God is doing is God draws these people together in grace. And God is still at work in our own time, drawing people together according to grace. God calls us not on our own merits. God doesn't call us because he says, you, you look holy, come to me. But instead, God reaches out in love and calls us all in grace. It's grace that brings us together at the table. It's grace that unites it. And it's from the seed of grace, the seed of fellowship that is planted at our Lord's table. It's as we learn to live that unity that is by grace around the table that it begins to grow out and to spread into the rest of our lives, our life as a church, but then also eventually our life in the world. And it's so important that the church understand itself as a community of grace. And when we ask the question, can I stay if you're here, it's so important that we come to understand the answer is a resounding yes, because I'm only here by grace. And which means you're here by grace, which means we are together in the grace of God. God united diversity in the church in Acts. God is uniting diversity in the church in our own day. God continues to be about this work. In this way, the church points toward the coming kingdom of God as God reconciles all things in Jesus Christ. The witness of the kingdom is at stake in our understanding that we are here by grace, that the church is meant to be a fellowship of grace. It means as we ask the question, can I stay if you're here, that we must answer it not according to our own sense of purity, and not according to our own sense of holiness, and not according to our own preferences, not according to our own, well, I'd rather but according to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And as we do that, it means that we learn to make space for each other. We learn to accommodate each other. We learn to encourage each other in faithfulness. We learn to uh, encourage each other as we wrestle and struggle with what it means to be saved in grace. Recently, I read a book called Slavery's Descendants. It's about shared legacies of race and slavery in America. It's an organization that was founded in the early 2000s. And around this theme, that families descended from slavery in the United States began to come together. Uh, white families who discovered that their families had owned slaves in the past began to search for the descendants of those slaves, and they began to meet. They began to gather together around a table. They began to wrestle with difficult questions. They laughed together. They cried together. They struggled together. And this book captures some of those stories. 
It's stories of people gathering around the table and sharing and being reconciled to each other, doing the hard work of hanging in with each other. That's grace work. It's grace work that comes to a table and, and hangs on to a difficult conversation. It's, it's grace work when we allow ourselves to be uncomfortable. It's grace work when we value another person, and even though they're different from us enough that we abide with them. It's grace work when someone is saying things that are foolish and that offend us, but we hang in with them because they matter. All that is grace work, and insofar as it's grace work, it's a beautiful picture to me of the church work. It's a beautiful picture of what it might mean to be the body of Christ in the world. Now, some might say, it sounds too difficult. I don't want to do that kind of hard work. Friends, we are not drawn into the life of the church so that we might have ease. We are not drawn into the life of the church so that we might have comfort. We are drawn into the life of the church so that by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, we might be made holy, even as God is holy. And growing in holiness, is bound to mean some growing pains. But thanks be to God in Jesus Christ, the holy God of heaven and earth is with us as we live in grace together. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, Laverne Heights Church family. My name is Johnny Evlett, and I'm an elder serving on session. Will you please join with me for the unison prayer of confession? Holy God, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burden of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. Now let's take a moment for personal silent confession. Lord, remind us of your mercy. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Please hear and receive the assurance of pardon. Beloved of God, hear the good news. Who in all creation is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life in God has begun. Remember the promise of God sealed by the Holy Spirit in your baptism and know that in Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Let all God's people say, Alleluia, Amen. stars are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth a thrill of hope the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn fall on your knees oh he the angels voice 
Brothers and sisters in Christ, please pray with me. Holy God, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you. Confident of your love and mercy, we offer our prayers. Empower the church throughout the world and its life and witness. Break down barriers that divide, that united in your truth and love, all may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the rulers of the nations. Move them to set aside their fear, greed, and vain ambition, and bow to your sovereign rule. Inspire them to strive for peace and justice, that all your children may dwell secure, free of war and injustice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear the cries of the world's hungry and suffering. Give us the will to order our lives in simplicity, that all may have their share of food, medical care, and shelter, and so live a life of dignity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase prejudices that oppress. Free us from crime and violence. Guard us from the perils of drugs and materialism. Give all citizens a new vision of life, of harmony. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Look with compassion on all who suffer. Support those with incurable diseases. Those in prison, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, and those who are homeless or abandoned. 
As you have moved towards us in love, lead us to be present with them in their suffering, Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain those among us who need your healing touch. Make the sick whole. Give hope to the dying. Comfort those who mourn. Uphold all who suffer in body or mind, that all may know the peace and joy of your supporting care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, in your loving purposes, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth, as, as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for joining us for another week of Church Online. As we prepare to head now into these final days of 2020, I want to invite you to receive the blessing. May the triune God go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you in obedient ministry, above you to watch over you, beneath you to uphold you, within you to give you faith, hope, and love, and before you to show you the way. Let all God's people say, Alleluia, Amen. Until God brings us together again, the Lord be with you.